Good afternoon and welcome back to the 2021 PJ Championship here at the Ocean Course in Kiowa Island, South Carolina. We're, we're really, really, really happy to be joined by a uh, two-time PJ champion and also a winning Ryder Cup captain from 1991, uh, Mr. Dave Stockton. Dave, uh, welcome back to uh, Kiowa Island. <laughs> Thank you. Good to be here. Um, maybe just... Uh, I don't know how often through the years you've been back here. I, I don't know if this is the first time in a long, long time, but what it's like for you to come here uh, and, and walk these grounds and see the sights, and and does it all come flooding back to you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Now, I've, I've been back probably 10 times, okay. so maybe even more. I've done quite a few corporate stuff. Uh, my highlights, obviously, were being the captain here in 91 and also coaching Rory with a short game when he won by eight in 2012. We won't talk about my playing in the senior PGA in 2007. I don't remember much about that. Okay. But uh, no, it uh, it brings back a lot of memories. I mean, I can remember. Obviously, none of this is here when we played in '91. I mean, Kathy and I came out, rode around with Die in January prior to it, and uh, there wasn't a blade of grass on the place. And I'm thinking, I mean, the odds of us having a successful tournament. I mean, I don't see how they can do it. And, I mean, we had our, our double-wide trailers down here somewhere near where these buildings are, but nothing else was here. Um, very different. Uh, but the, the golf course itself was, uh, it was a masterpiece from the start. Uh, it, for him to design it the way he did, where none of the water goes back into the marshes or nothing goes to the ocean, I mean, I can't conceive of it. The, the hard part for the players now is the golf course goes basically one direction. And the wind changed every single day during the Ryder Cup. And it, uh, if it's going to help you one direction, it'll kill you the other half. So no matter which way the wind blows, you're going to have to have nine holes of some kind of hardship one way or the other. But uh, it, was, it was a thrill, the biggest thrill for Kathy and I to be able to represent the United States and to be a Ryder Cup captain. And, it was stri stressful times, obviously, for us because it had been, you know, six or eight years since the Cup had been back. In fact, the one memory that really sticks in my mind was I enjoyed them flying over and circling the course with the Concorde, bringing the Cup back to where I thought it belonged. And uh, we got to keep it here, which made it, made it memorable for us, for sure. In your estimation, I, I, I've heard other people say it, but... That, uh, that Ryder Cup in 1991 really kind of launched what is maybe the modern Ryder Cup. Do you agree with that notion and, and that it has a – that there's so many chapters, 40-plus chapters of this event, but that one had a little bit more meaning in, than some of the others? I think for, for quite a few reasons. Number one, I mean, when I was selected as the captain, uh, I followed Raymond Floyd, obviously. I almost got it the year, and I, I would have had to be the captain overseas, which I'd much prefer to be here on home soil. Theoretically, it was easier until Nicholas got beat in 87, four years ahead of us, at his own golf course. And I go, oh, my gosh, this is going to be harder than I thought. But the, it's the, it, it just, to me, uh, launched the thing. And that's why, instead of me being the captain of PJ West, and they realized it was going to be televised, and they had a three-hour time change, they had to go to somewhere on the East Coast. So they got about as far east as they could possibly go and then said, okay, we'll put the golf course down here. And Di was the man for the job. Uh, there was, you know, for us, it, it was a big challenge. I thought it favored the Europeans, but the Europeans never came in and played a practice round, which I couldn't understand, you know, because I, I just think this is such a difficult golf course with the winds and the way the golf course is built, because you can't hit all the greens, you're going to be running off all the time, that I think we prepared better than they did. Great perspective. Uh, Juan, do you want to take the next question? So in, in connection to what you were saying about the Europeans, do you think it was arrogance? Do you think they took it for granted that they could beat the American team? Or? Well, I don't blame them. They've done a pretty good job of it. Uh, yeah. But I, no, I don't think arrogance entered into it. I mean, I... I was disappointed that we actually had to invite them to play. I mean, I thought they would come in. It was literally, here I am in January, no grass. By the time they put, we played the Masters, it was playable. But I thought some of them would come from Hilton Head or some of them would come from the Masters. Nobody came. It yeah. kind of reminds me of us flying over to France 
three years ago now, and I don't. I think five of our 12 players had played the golf course, and all I heard in France was that it was a tight golf course. Well, I thought it'd be tree line. Somebody tells me tight, little did I know you could put 5,000 sheep on there, and they could have been there for years and not cut all that grass down, and there weren't that many trees. And you had to hit it just dead straight, and none of our guys basically had hardly played the thing. And they'd played the French Open there for 30 years. So now we come forward to Whistling Straits coming up here shortly, and the Europeans have played it just as much as we have, so we're going to have our hands full. I'm, I'm hoping in two years' time in Rome that we, a bunch of our guys play the Italian Open that's going to be played at that golf course so that we don't walk in and get shell-shocked. So, so the fact that you had a new course in 91, and you were saying France, that was changed for the Ryder Cup in a way, and uh, the, the fact that you can build something new, and, and Rome is going to be that way, it makes you able to set the course for your team in a way. You sure, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. You can set the, I mean, Pete Dye was very disappointed with me that I wouldn't let him use the back tee on 14 here, yeah. which I didn't see how you could play that hole from 200 yards, yeah. you know, but... You know, and he was not happy. He would be very, he's, he's smiling. If they play that, if they won't play it with this wind, I'll guarantee you, either 14 or 17. But, but if it changes and comes out of the other side, they'll play it back. And uh, heaven help them, you know. Even, the, even some of the guys that I know are out there, they're not, they're not too enthusiastic about a couple of those holes out there. Can, can you talk a little bit about the tension in 91 and, and kind of the feistiness? And I know from both sides. I mean, and well, talking about no, people like I'm, Sevi. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm yeah. not into that. I my fault yeah. was that I like to hunt, <laughs> so I was going to get some camouflage hats. In fact, I went down today, and they did have a camouflage hat in there mm. in the <laughs> tent. So I got a camouflage hat from this year, just for my son and for Ronnie and I. Okay. I don't know what Junior's going to pick out, but the the thing I did not like was the the term "war by the shore." Yeah. Um, because we're all friends, this is a world tour now. And I called, when we got here, uh, I called Gallagher their captain. The only night that was free that we didn't have some obligation to the PGAs, our separate PGAs, was on Tuesday night. And I called him, I said, I'd like to have a low country cookout. And I'd like you to have, if you wanna come, to have you invite your team and their immediate family. No PGA officials, no officials. I want to have just our two teams get together. And we did. That's how we started the week. Yeah. We ended the week, which they were much more gracious in defeat than I think we would have been. I mean, they were unbelievable. I mean, we had, in those days, we had a finishing dinner, which we don't have now. But two buses were there for us to get in, I guess one team and the other. Well, by the time I come down, the one bus is like eight seats shy of getting filled with only three seats are gonna be left over. And Woozy turns to, he turns to me, he says, Stocky, he says, not to worry, Pavin's so small, I'll carry him on. He picked Pavin up and carried him right on the bus, and we rode in one bus. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you can call it War by the Shore. I never went to the tent over there because I didn't have time. Oh, my God. I mean, I had two, two assistants, both my boys. I, I'm so, I mean, we have six American assistants this year, and you need it because you've got to be making pairings. You, got, you are only paying two-thirds of your field, so four people, you need to monitor how they're playing. All these different things going on, and it's just, it, it was a whirlwind for me, uh, all the preparation and planning. But it's, and to answer your long answer to your question, I can see why this was a start, because the PGA was smart enough to do the television on it, and it was much watch TV from the get-go. And uh, I, it was fun to be a part of it. I've been, was assistant to Azinger in, in 2008. In fact, I, on my resume, if I had one, would be I'm a few Americans have been in four Ryder Cups and never lost one. So, unfortunately, there's a lot not many Americans that could say that now. Let's go to number eight. Yes, sir. Hey, uh, Dave. Um, uh, you're obviously so influential in the world of putting, uh, helping players improve. Uh, I'm I'm just curious, like what in sort of layman's terms would you say are the essential qualities that separate a good putter from a putter like me? <laughs> well, it, it's, I, I'm going to tell you it's simple, but, but a lot of people don't believe that. But I generally, the first lesson, do a two-hour lesson, and I generally could stop after about 20 minutes. Personal, generally get it. Uh, I've opened, the, my sons and I have opened the PGA seminar down there in, in Orlando. And 
And when you open it up for questions after talking for about a half an hour, and they're all PGA professionals, 90% of the questions you get are mechanical. I don't understand that. How many things can you think about if you're throwing a dart at a dartboard? I don't think very many. I mean, but you take it the typical putter who plays putting with his left brain instead of his creative right side. And he's standing there. Of course, they'll put the line on the ball because they see the pros do it. Then he has four or five practice strokes. All these things, right? I just get up and hit. I just get up and roll it. It's either going to go in or not go in. And for a first lesson, if you were going to have a lesson for me, the first thing I would do is have you sign your signature. Right below, it'll take you three or four seconds, and you'll do it. Okay? Right below it, I want you to take 20 seconds, and I want you to duplicate your first signature exactly. You will not be able to do the first letter in your name. And the reason why, it's not, if it's something that should be in your subconscious and you are trying really hard to get this, that's why you can't putt. So the key is to have someone look out. It's like throwing a dart. That hole is our bullseye. And the ball's here. All it's got to do is go in there. So your focus has to be as you set your feet. I want it to come in at 5 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 8 o'clock, whatever the break is, and then come back. And in my case, I was taught by my dad to putt an inch ahead of the ball, pick a spot in the back of my left hand, which I'm not going to break down. It's going to go right through. All it has to do is go an inch. He wanted me to give him one inch with no recoil or no coming up. And you're going to see a whole lot of that this week, especially with this wind. So putting to me is feel. And you ask, have you ever played billiards, shot pool? Uh, just for fun, yeah. OK, well, if, if you, you take practice strokes and you putt? Uh, when I putt, I do, yeah. OK, sure. So obviously, you do that to get feel, right? So when you're shooting billiards, do you step up beside the cue ball a foot and practice to get your feel? Uh-uh. You don't. Now, you put the cue stick behind it, correct? Yes. OK. Now, you just hold it there and not move it? No. You move it back and forth. So I've been taught to never let the putter basically sit still. I put it in front of the ball, bring it over the ball, one last look at the hole, and I let it go. And it's amazing. It goes in all the time. It doesn't help you to try. First word I'd tell you, if you're putting, don't try. You want, to, you want to putt with feel. And the guys have to this week with this much wind. They're going to have to play more break than they're comfortable playing because they can't ram it. Because if they ram it, it's not going to be a good result. OK? Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Babineau, number hey, four. Along those lines, uh, when you look at great putters through the years, what, what part of it is work and what part of it is innate? The really good ones, it's just something they're born with. You can learn it. There are certain people that are very, very mechanical. But those are the ones I try to, I try to just, everything I can, I'll tell them, OK, I want you to putt it before I count to four, if they're taking 12 seconds to putt. I mean, the second major, I, well, second PGA, I won a congressional. I had a 15-footer, and if I miss it, I'm going to be in a playoff with, with January and Floyd. The total time when I put the, my coin hit the ground behind the ball, the ball was gone in 14 seconds. You know, at that time, it was the longest putt to win the PGA. And it went dead center. I mean, you just, it, it's, it, it's really, it's, it's not as hard as people think and make it is. You know, and that's, to me, it's, I, I believe personally that I putt with my left hand, like Tiger and I would have fights, because he likes to putt with his right, although his right goes through and he's got a wonderful putting stroke. Most people take a right-handed putting stroke, and they're closing it. They're not doing what Tiger does. I've been taught that my we I don't do anything with my left hand, but the back of my left hand gives me that, that inch to go through. It goes right over my, my imaginary spot. The ball's gone, and I am really good from an inch. I don't miss much from an inch. And I was going to ask you, too, that you had a great insight into the building of this course. As you look at it, what do you see as the biggest challenge here? <laughs> Uh, the easiest part is the driving, and past that, good luck. I mean, it's just, I, I think the par threes are extremely difficult. This win, you can't get to 14 and 17 hardly, okay, but if but the same win, you can't stop it on number eight. And number, the other, and the other end out there, you get the sideways win from this win, you're not comfortable on any of it. Then you finally get a short hole if you start on two if you're lucky enough to start par par or whatever you got you got a hole you can drive it right underneath the green but good luck in hitting the green 
I mean, it, the, the toughest thing and the best things that's going to win this tournament, and Rory did it in 2012, is you have to be brilliant around the greens. Not necessarily the putting, but you have to be really good with the chip shots and stuff because there's a lot of waste areas you roll into. One, number two. I'm, I'm curious, what do you think about green books then? Uh, the books are fine. I mean, I just, I, I think that basically aim point, anything that helps some of them and anything that will speed them up. It, it drives me nuts to see them pick a book out and they're looking, studying the screen. And of course, they got all the lines and everything on it. I never had to use that. I never, you know, the ball's very small and the hole's quite large. I never had, it's not about perfect. You know, that's, you know, obviously the whole game entirely. You, that's why a lot of guys don't play good anymore and become announcers. And as they sit up in the booth, they realize, hey, these guys don't hit it perfect. You know, you know, we chase our foul balls. We got to. And to me, I think I, I, I'm more hands-on. I'm more visual like anything else. I mean, I'm playing darts out there. To me, a golf course is like a chess match. I mean, I don't play chess, but I know, I know how to plod my way around things. You know, because I've always been an extremely short hitter, but yet I've won on some really, really long golf courses. You know, you just have to fit to whatever you got. I mean, and they will have their hands full this week. Oh, my God. There'll be some tired puppies by the time they get out of here. The Ryder Cup, 30 years later, if you compare 91 to 2021 now, what would be the main difference from the players' point of view? I mean, how do they prepare? I think, I think the difference is one team... Didn't know Kiowa very well. And I think everybody knows Whistling Straits, you know. So from that point of view, we're pretty on even keel this year. It's interesting, and I'm going to be interested to see how they do that. I was talking to Pad Padrick yesterday. He's only using three captain's picks, which confuses me a bit because since Azinger in 2008, he was because I had two picks here. I would have loved to have like Azinger in 2008 and have four picks. Okay, but Stricker's got six, and I, 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 I haven't even got into with the COVID. I have no idea. I've been away from everything, but I don't understand that. I guess Padre could have had any he wanted, and all he wanted was three, and I'm thinking, well, that's fine. You could still take the next three, you know, or, or Stricker could, but to have the luxury in a year that not everybody's played the full schedule, I think that favors the United States to a, to a certain extent. Dave, I want to ask you about uh, your yeah, two PJ Championships. Right here. Oh, go ahead. I'm yes, sorry. sorry. Dave, I'm sorry if you've already answered this. Um, I think you visited the site before it was built. Yes. Back in, and then, can you talk about your impressions then, and then when you came back and saw the the finished product? Well, I was I was just literally amazed. I mean, Kathy and I drove around with Pete in January, and uh, I mean there was it was being worked on. I mean, that's all I can tell you. I mean, they were constructing as best they could with, you know, creating the mounds and putting sea oats on it and stuff uh, very uniquely, but I won't get into that. But they're, you know, sea oats were coming from somewhere and sea oats ended up out here on the golf course. And digested, you cannot hand it to the man. I mean, I don't know. I'm glad nobody else had, was given this job. And it was a, it was a fair, fair golf course to be sure, but extremely difficult. And I mentioned before, I was never so happy to stand behind the first tee. And you go get them, guys. And I didn't have to hit a single shot. I mean, I had no desire to go out there and get killed. Yes, sir. Go on. I was going to ask about your uh, two PJ Championship victories, at least briefly. Um, you win in 1970, beat uh, Arnold Palmer by a couple shots. I mean, that, did that, that must have just changed your life to become a major champion. What was that moment like for you? Well, it, it was, obviously. I had... Uh, Thought I'd had a pretty good career. I'd started. It took me three years, but I won Colonial, and then I won the Hagen Hag with Laurie Hammer at La Costa. And then while Kathy was pregnant, I won Cleveland. Flew back home to see what we were going to have. We didn't know a boy or a girl. And the doctor said it wouldn't come, so I flew out to Milwaukee and won Milwaukee by four, beating Sam Snead, which it, times changed. It was a $200,000 tournament, first ever on the PGA Tour. And I got 40000 he got 24000 which was his biggest check ever on the tour for finishing second. And so when I came the following year to Southern Hills, 
I'd finished reading the book Cycle Cybernetics that my dad had me read, which I hated. I mean, it's like reading sand. And, but I finally underlined it, and I realized I took two things out of the book. One is that you have to be aggressive when you play, which was as short as I hit it, kind of ridiculous. But the other side of the coin was that you had to picture what you wanted to accomplish before you even accomplished it. So I played my practice round at Southern Hills on Monday, picturing that I'm, I'm the winner. I've won this tournament. And I came up to 18, and there wasn't anybody up there, but I visualized on Sunday there's going to be 20,000 people. Little did I know, my wife, who's stuck in the clubhouse because she's going to have Ronnie 30 days later, I, <laughs> I'm playing with Arnold. If Arnold wins, he wins the Grand Slam. If I win, I win a major. So I start out with a three-shot lead, and my best supporter stuck in the clubhouse. And it was... I mean, I played phenomenally. I three-putted five, and a guy in the gallery typically yelled, you got him now, Dave. You got him now, Arnold. And I went birdie two on the par three, bird eagle two on seven, the par four, double bogey five on this par three, which as long as they make him, it played like 230 in those, in that, I don't know what it'll play this time. But I double bogeyed and then hit it in the fairway bunker on nine and put it right through an oak tree a foot from the hole for a birdie. So I go two birdies, an eagle, and a double, and I got a seven-shot lead. So, and I played safe on 18 to make five, win by two. If I had needed to, I could have gone for the green, but as Hubert Green found out on the open in 77, that doesn't really pay off too well. And so it, to me, I won it. The second one in 76 was totally different. Yeah. I, had, I had basically, once I won the PGA, it changed my life because now I have a 10 year, oh, that's another story, but 10 year exemption. Right. A month prior to the PGA, I led the revolt it was stupid that these guys got a lifetime exemption for winning the PGA. Because certain guys, Jerry Barber and a few others, would, would never quit playing, and they wouldn't break 80. But they had this exemption. So to my brilliant strategy, I now have a 10-year exemption, go to 76, and I end up winning again. I, I went to the PGA. I said, well, can I add 10 on to 10 so I get 20? And they said, no, you get six. So I won two PGAs and got 16 years. But it, it sets you up. When you're, when you're just going town to town and everything like that, uh, I was very fortunate. But at Congressional, the second one was totally, totally different picture. We spent all day Monday at the White House. I had no, no clue that I was going to win this, and I shouldn't have. But we spent with President Ford at the White House all day that Monday. And it was the bicentennial. So we were, you know, it was fantastic. But... I, I show up on Sunday, I'm in the top 12 or so, and I play the first three holes, and I'm, I'm the first five holes, and I'm three over. And they rain the entire round out. So you, it wasn't like you get re, you, had, you couldn't have to come back to where you finished, you had to got to start over. I'm two under the same five on Monday, five shot swing. Yeah, and I win by one. So, and I, my thought was a lot of things. One, I, I proved the first PGA wasn't a fluke. So I've got the second. The other one is I bet they'll make me a Ryder Cup captain, or I've got a hell of a shot at it, because my good friends Bobby Nichols and Guy Berger didn't get picked, and they were PGA champions, because there had only been two guys at 91 until 91 that had ever not won the PGA and been a Ryder Cup captain, and that's Casper and Palmer. So I knew I had a chance to go into, you know, quite a deal, but it's, I, and I, my last thought was there gotta be 20 guys shooting themselves tonight because they should have won it. There's no way in heck I should have won it. But it goes that way sometimes. Uh, Jeff, go ahead, number four. If, if we asked you for your single most vivid snapshot from the 91 win here, what would it be? Probably longer missing the putt, obviously. I mean, I, I, had, I, had, I had my head down the whole time. I. Uh, I knew he was going to make it, and I felt bad because we hadn't lost, but and unfortunately we hadn't won. And I, you know, because there's no way I was going to root against him not to make. That was just I was so I was basically I was mad at Gallagher to put somebody whose stress in their game is on their putting to put him in the last spot. I mean, I had Watkins and Irwin. I I can't conceive of somebody winning three U.S. Opens, so I figure I put. Irwin there, he can't choke under pressure. If he does, it'll be less than somebody else. But to put that pressure on longer and to have him miss it, uh, I mean, it made for a thrilling finish, but 
you know, I was really disappointed. I was happier as anybody when he went over and won the German BMW the following week. It just, it was, it was bad timing. And I, if he had been next to last or something, I mean, we all know now on the Champions Tour how great a player he was and is, you know, as an individual. And uh, that was the one thing I remember. The other thing was, was the Concorde bringing the, bringing the trophy back for us to play for. I thought that was really cool. I mean, this is, the place has really changed, but it's, it's cool. Right over. It circled twice. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Yep. Maybe it was one, a big deal. One yeah. last question for you. Um, is there a special kinship amongst that group on the American side, the 91 team, that you, when you see each other, is, is there a special feeling of belonging amongst the, the uh, 13 of you and any vice captains? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I had, I had a really strong group. I mean, between Payne Stewart and Lanny Watkins, uh, I was talking to Julius there after lunch that, there were four of us that not, we, whenever we met, all we did was talk about the Ryder Cup and how we, what we would do as captains. And it was Azinger and myself, and Payne Stewart, and Lanny Watkins. And Watkins, if you remember back, got beat because he picked Curtis Strange, which I felt bad for him because I passed on Curtis and I, I told Curtis he had a spot on my team, but he was playing so badly that we just talked and I said, I don't see, I mean, I told you I, I will pick you. He said, no, Captain, I'm not playing good enough. So he got passed, and Lanny took him, and he ended up losing all his points. But, it, I mean, small things are going to, you know, win out. Of course, Payne gets killed, and, and just he, he would have had the Ryder Cup overseas when Lehman took his place. But uh, Azinger, to be, Azinger and I are good friends. Azinger, when he went through cancer, stayed at our house. For, we just left, since we're on tour, you know, it's easy to leave your house. So he moved into our house for six months when he went to treatment for cancer out in California. And so he and I have a bond and that was, it was fun to be an assistant on his, which I think in my mind, the 2008 team is the best team, best prepared team ever in Ryder Cup. What I take away from my team and we are close is that nobody could tell us which one of our players carried us because nobody carried us. It was a team effort. Well said. Dave Stockman, thanks for coming by, uh, reminiscing about uh, two things that are near and dear to the PJ of America, the Ryder Cup, and uh, your PJ Championship wins. Good. Thank you for your time. Good. Look forward to seeing you guys at my first win next year at, at uh, Southern Hills. Absolutely. We'll All do right. it again, right?